Good morning. Welcome to Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Today is Sunday, August 11th, 2024. This morning, Pastor Angelic Williams shares a message based upon the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, entitled Lakeside Lessons on Faith. We pray that the message this week blesses you and encourages you for the week to come. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, entitled in our Common English Bible, Walking on the Water. Right then, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake, while he dismissed the crowds. When he sent them away, he went up onto a mountain by himself to pray. Evening came, and he was alone. Meanwhile, the boat, fighting a strong headwind, was being battered by the waves and was already far away from land. Very early in the morning, he came to his disciples walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. They were so frightened, they screamed. Then... Jesus spoke to them, Be encouraged, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter replied, Lord, if it is you, order me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. Then Peter got out of the boat and was walking on the water towards Jesus. But when Peter saw the strong wind, he became frightened. As he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, rescue me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him, saying, You man of weak faith, why did you begin to have doubts? When they got onto the boat, the wind settled down. Then those in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, You must be God's son. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. that we uh, tend to overlook about faith is that faith is like a muscle. We have to exercise it and use it in order for it to grow stronger and stronger. I think that I would love to believe that we all one day ask Jesus to come into our hearts and we suddenly have mountain moving faith where we believe all the things that we do not see and we trust God for everything that we absolutely need. The fact of the matter and the reality is, is that faith is like a muscle. We have to develop it and we have to grow it. And over time, it gets strong, stronger and stronger. We trust what we know. And when we first come to Jesus, we are merely acquaintances of him. But we learn more and more about who Jesus is, both in character and who he is in our life as we get to know him, as we nurture our relationship with him. The way in which we nurture our relationship with him, we do that through prayer, we do that for reading the word, and we do that when we have opportunities in our life that allow us to be dependent on God in a way that allows him to come through for us. And so this is why I say faith is like a muscle that we have to use and exercise and grow. The disciples, when we come to this particular text, Jesus is at Um, starting to get at the height of his ministry, he has uh, begun to develop this reputation of being a healer. He's developed this reputation of signs and wonders following his ministry. And because he's developed this reputation of healing folks, everybody is flocking to him. They're chasing him down. Everywhere he goes, people in droves and crowds are bringing him. They're bringing people who are lame, people who have all kinds of ailments, and they are seeking Jesus because they want to get a touch from him. They want their lives to be transformed. And when you see at the top of this text, when Jesus is trying to retreat and have some alone time, he's doing that so that he can replenish himself. He's doing that so that he can rest and that he can recover. 
sometimes I think in our lives, we want to help everybody and we want to be in place, but we have to remember that rest is a part of the process. We have to have some rest and some time to refill our cups. We can't serve others from an empty cup. That's why it says that our cup should be filled and running over. What's in the cup is for you. And what's running out of the cup is for everybody else. And so Jesus was taking some time to commune with his father at the top of this text. So what he does is he tells his disciples, you guys go ahead and go ahead without me. Go to the next location without me. I'm going to stay here because I want to have some time to commune with my father. And so what happens is, is that when they leave, so does the transportation. The boat is gone. And so Jesus is coming to them and he is walking on the water. Now, the disciples have been walking with Jesus for a little bit here, but what we see happening is, is that they get terrified because they see this image coming to them on the, on the water, and they begin to say, wait a minute, who is that a ghost? Like, what is that? I imagine that they probably was a little bit disoriented because it's very, very dark, and I don't know if you've been on a boat at night, but there is, it's very dark. When God turns the lights out, it is dark. You can see nothing. Sometimes you can't even see a hand waving in front of your face. And so they're not real clear about who this is, but they are really sort of concerned because what happens is, is a storm starts to pick up. And the, the there's a storm and this disturbance on the water. And they're like, wait a minute, hold on. We, we're, in we're encountering some difficulty and some challenges and Jesus is not here. Where is Jesus? are looking for him he is nowhere to be found and so they see this image and they're looking like is that a ghost and so now they're afraid at what's up, what might be on the water and they're afraid at what they are getting they're getting this battling of the winds and and the boat is sort of moving around and they're becoming a bit terrified they're on a body of water that is typically known for very quick storms to brew up very quickly and so jesus begins to reassure them he says don't be afraid it's me. And the first thing I thought when I read that was like, me who? <laughs> me who? I wonder what me it is. And it says that they are terrified. And Peter is discerning something. You ever heard a voice and say, voice is familiar. I hear something. That sounds like something that's really familiar to me. And he says, Lord, if it's you, can I come out there with you? There's some familiarity that's piquing Peter's attention, but the rest of the disciples, like, yeah, I don't know who that is. I'm going to stay right here. I don't know who that me is. I'm going to stay right here on the boat. Sort of reminds me of mothers when you're in department stores and you have small children and they hide under the clothes and, and you hear all of a sudden a little crying voice or somebody saying, mom, mom a mother will know which child's voice it is. I know my mother has three children. And if one of us says, Ma, she'll be like, yes, Angelique. Yes, Crystal. She knows the voice because she has taken so much time to nurture her relationship with us that that familiarity is instantly recognizable. I think that's sort of one of the lessons we want to pick up from this is that when Jesus speaks, if we are in relationship with him, his voice should be recognizable. We should be able to say, hmm, sound like Jesus. Equally so, when we hear some voices that don't sound like Jesus, we should always say, whoa, whoa, time out. That don't sound like Jesus at all. So when somebody, and you have this sort of all of a sudden notion to maybe tell your boss off, like, listen, I'm sick of you trying to order me around in this place. Or maybe it's a neighbor who's being not so nice and it's something that makes you want to sort of snap at them. That might not be the voice of Jesus, but the voice of Jesus would tell you to love your neighbors as yourself and to pray for them that so spitefully use you. And so that's where we get this sort of lesson on the lake about being able to nurture our relationship in, with God in such a way that his voice is always recognizable. Now, I don't always mean audible voice. Sometimes God is speaking in ways that is not audible. He is speaking through his people. He's speaking through a smile that you see with your waiter or your cashier at the grocery store. 
he's speaking to us when we see someone in need or in pain and we offer ourselves to serve them. Lots of ways that Jesus is speaking. And so he tells Peter, come on, you can come on the water with me. Now, remember, this boat is being battered by wind and waves. And there is some tumultuous times going on on this boat. And now Peter is taking this huge step to leave the boat where he probably has a little bit more safety and security to go out on the water where the wind and the waves are. He's willing to leave the little bit of safety that he has in order to follow the sure voice of Jesus, no matter what that looks like. I think that shows us that here is where Peter is exercising his faith. He is putting his faith and his trust in something that he cannot see. Looks like Jesus, but it could be a ghost too. Sounds like Jesus, but it also could be my imagination because I am scared right now. But he takes this chance to step out. He's on the boat with all of the other disciples. So he is in community. He's in a place of comfort. So in community, the one thing you can say to yourself is if the boat go down, at least we all going down together. But he does not do that. He leaves his place of a little bit of comfort, some security, and he goes out on the water. Now here is, a, a, this text is very familiar and I've heard it preached so many times I can't even count. And in this, in this uh, text, Peter oftentimes gets a bad rap because what he does is he goes out and he's walking on the water and all of a sudden the winds and the waves pick up and he sees it and he gets afraid and all of a sudden he's sinking and he has to say, Lord, help me. And so Peter gets a bad rap because Jesus says to him, oh, ye of little faith. We get lots and lots of sermons that tells us, keep your eyes focused on God. Don't be like Peter. But I like to redeem Peter just a little bit in this text because I want us to recognize a few things that we can learn from Peter's experience. Peter was willing to leave the boat in his spirit place of comfort and community to be able to follow the voice of God. And I think that that takes boldness. And I think that takes bravery to follow Jesus when no one else is following him. To do and go out to a place that does not appear and seem to be safe because we know that Jesus is there. So that's why I'm feeling very much admiration for Peter because although he sunk when the winds and the waves, when he took his focus on God, he still goes down in history as the only disciple to walk on water. I think that's pretty impressive that he had the courage to go out and leave his place of security and take a launch out on the deep. I also find Peter admirable for another reason, because when he begins to sink and he calls out to God for help, Peter knows exactly who can help him. He knows exactly who to call on. And I wonder if in our own lives, when things get difficult, when things get out of control, when we lose our focus and we find ourselves sinking in the circumstances of life, sinking in the difficulty that life may have been given us, do we truly know who to call? Do we open up our mouths and call on the only one who is able to keep us from falling, to pick us up when we're down? And that is Jesus. I am enthralled with Peter because Peter knew exactly who to call. He didn't let the difficulty of the circumstances and the situation allow him to just sink. He immediately called out to the Lord for help. And I wonder if we would spend more time allowing Jesus to rescue us, more time depending on him, more time making sure he's our first call. Because sometimes when I'm having some difficulty, I like to call my mom and say, mom, what do you think? 
And what do you, she got you to do? What you happen? And sometimes I want to call my sister and see what my big sister might have to say. Sometimes I might want to call my best friend and say, hey, what do you think? Sometimes I want to call my prayer partner. And that's nothing wrong with any of those things. But our first call should be to God. Our first call when we are in trouble is to call on the name of Jesus. And it is Jesus who saves. It is Jesus. See, Jesus brought salvation to the world so that our names would be written in the Lamb's Book of Life so that we would receive eternal life. But he's a savior in everyday life too. He wants to leap tall buildings in a single bound in your life, just like superheroes do. He wants to come to your aid for the big things and the little ones, the little things that you think is so minimal that you don't even want to spend time in prayer about. The things that we feel like we should handle ourselves, things that we can handle ourselves. Faith has to be exercised. We have to use it in order to get that muscle strong. So sometimes we might be believing him for a promotion at work. Somebody might be believing him for a, be able to put meal on the table for their children for the rest of the week. Everybody has a different ask of God a different need of God, and everyone needs him to rescue them in one way or another. Some folks need him to rescue him in families. Sometimes we believe in God to bring families closer together. Sometimes we believe in God for healing. We're believing God for all kinds of things, and we are putting our faith and exercising our faith in something that we have not seen before. What do you need to exercise your faith with today? What are you believing and trusting God for? I just want you to take a minute to think about something that you need God to do that you're, you don't see any manifestation of it because faith is believing in something that we don't have any proof of. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. I am here at Mount Vernon Place and I am speaking a message of faith and I'm going to say I'm speaking this message all over the auditorium. And you may say, this lady's crazy. It's just a room with a few people. But I see something that I don't see. I have to be able to see it in the spirit before it manifests in the natural. I don't know who and what God is going to send our way here at Mount Vernon Place. But I believe in one thing in particular, and that is resurrection power. The same power that Jesus used to get up and raise from the dead so that now he's seated at the right hand of the Father is the same way that he can resurrect anything that looks dead. So you see a few people, I see a whole auditorium. And I'm telling Jeff, make sure we got sound way there in the back. Make sure that they can hear us. Why? Because I see what I don't see. What do you need to see that you don't see? What are you believing God for yourself, for your friends and for your family, maybe even your community that you see no evidence of? Peter walked on water because he believed in something that he could not see. He couldn't tell if it was a ghost. Maybe it's Jesus. I'm not really sure. I'm looking. It's dark out here. I don't have a flashlight. Can't quite make it out. Voice sounds familiar. I'm just going to walk toward the voice. And that's what God is asking us to do today, to follow his voice. He says, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. Sheep follow the voice of the shepherd. And so today I want to encourage you to stretch your faith beyond what you can see, to put your affection on things that you cannot see, things that you can put in the hands of the master because Jesus is able to save us from sin, but he's also able to save us from any and everything that we encounter. Are you ready to walk on water? Are you ready to walk toward the voice that sounds a little familiar, but you're not quite sure what it is? I don't know what I'm going to get when I get out there, 
but I am willing to take a chance. I'm willing to risk it. I'm willing to walk on water because I am going to go in the direction of the voice of God. And if that means I have to leave all my friends in the boat, that means I have to leave all my comfort and community, I'm going to go out there. One of the things that Peter's uh, walk on the water did as well for his community, his other believers, other disciples that was on the boat. When he got back on the boat, when Jesus got back on the boat, it says that the wind and the waves stopped. Jesus' presence brings about a calm and brings about peace in situations that are tumultuous. But they're witnessing all that took place. Peter walking on the water and then Peter sinking and then Peter calling for help. They were witnesses to what that did. And what did that do for the community? It brought the community from a place of fear to a place of worship. It says that when Jesus got back on the boat and the wind and the waves stopped, it says that they all worshiped him. And they said one thing that really impressed me. They said, this must be the son of God. Like, I mean, we've been walking with him all this time. We've been saw him do all of these miracles and all these wonderful things. But well, hold on a minute. I think he might really be the son of God. I, I like, this is like a real revelation here. I know we didn't see him heal people. We didn't see all this manifestation. But did you just see that? It was what the water. The wind and the waves are stopped. Jesus wants to blow your mind all over again so that you too will say, he must be the son of God. He's got to be the son of God. How else would wind and waves obey him? That's weather patterns. They don't obey anybody, but they obey the voice of God. And so should we. God bless you. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining us today. If the people of Mount Vernon Place United Methodist Church may be of service to you, please email us at mvpumcbaltimore at gmail.com. But for now, may the Lord bless you and keep you until we can meet again. God be with you.